Once in a while, an athlete comes along who is so perfect at what they do, they redefine the limits of human ability. People like Usain Bolt or Muhammad Ali took physical prowess and made it into an art form. Yet their names still pale beside that of one man. Jesse Owens was likely the greatest athlete of the 20th century. Before he'd finished high school, he was faster than most Olympians. While still in college, he set three world records and matched a fourth, all within one unbelievable 45-minute period. By the end of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, he was the world's greatest sprinter, able to demolish the Aryan Superman sent to challenge him with absolute ease. But while the Olympics made him famous, there's much more to the story of Jesse Owens than that one shining moment. Born into dire poverty in an era of racial violence, Owens overcame the challenges of life in a segregated society to rise to the top. But within months of his historic victory, he had been banned from racing and reduced to sideshows, rejected by the country he had just won four gold medals for. A story of pain, triumph, and humiliation, this is the life of Jesse Owens, the athlete who humiliated Hitler. When James Cleveland Owens was born on September 12, 1913, it was into poverty so biting it's a wonder the boy wasn't simply swallowed whole. The tenth child of an Alabama sharecropper, Owens was just two generations removed from the horrors of slavery, and life for the poor and black was still a nightmare. The entire family was forced to live in one tiny shack outside Oakville, while his dad, Henry's work, barely brought in enough to cover food and necessities. And that's when they could afford food at all. In later life, Owens would say of his childhood, I can remember many days of hunger, days where there was not enough clothing to cover our bodies, days of embarrassment. Yet, while they were dirt poor, they weren't miserable. In the place they lived, in the era they lived, everyone was dirt poor. Young JC, as the family called Owens, wouldn't find out for years that there was any other way to be. In a way, this ignorance was a comfort blanket. He could be happy with his one-room school, with helping his dad haul cotton in the fields, because he simply didn't know any different. For Owens' parents, though, their situation was all too clear and all too desperate. There's a story from JC's fifth birthday in 1918. That day, the boy noticed a lump on his chest. He tried to ignore it, but it grew bigger until it was pressing on his lungs and making it difficult to breathe. Unable to afford medical care, his mother sterilized a knife in a flame. Then, while Henry Owens sat weeping in the corner, she made young JC bite down on a strip of leather and cut the lump out of him. The removal of the tumor left a golf ball sized hole in the boy's chest that wouldn't stop bleeding. According to Owens, it was only when he went out with his father into the dark, hot Alabama night and prayed with him that the wound finally healed. Nor was this the only illness JC suffered. Throughout his childhood, he had repeated brushes with bronchitis and pneumonia, yet the family's financial situation was so precarious that he still had to work in the fields as much as possible. But don't go thinking that this was all a childhood of work and no play. Though Owens and his many siblings helped Henry pick cotton, they also had a ton of free time. Free time Owens spent running barefoot through the dusty fields. You won't be surprised to hear that those moments were the happiest in the boy's life. But if Owens was young enough and sheltered enough to ignore his parents' hard scrabble existence, there was no way he could ignore the way that society was changing. The outbreak of World War I had caused a labor shortage in the North's factories, so used to relying on European immigrants. Not long after the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan led to renewed racial violence across the South, with lynchings and race riots exploding in cities. Taken together, these two factors caused one of the biggest mass movements in American history, the Great Migration. Starting in 1916, millions of rural black southern families packed up their bags and headed north to take factory jobs in the cities. Among them were the Owenses. In early 1922, when JC was just eight, his family left behind their home in Alabama and headed to Cleveland, Ohio. On his first day in his new school, the teacher asked for his name. Owens told her he was called JC, but his southern accent was so thick that the teacher misheard and wrote Jesse. From that moment on, the boy would be JC no more. He would be Jesse Owens until the day he died. Despite the promise of the Great Migration, the Owenses didn't find life easier in the North. Henry and the older boys got low-paying jobs in factories, while Jesse worked a string of odd jobs after school, loading freight cars one week, working in a shoe repair store the next. At this point, his greatest ambition was to open his own shoe store. There was nothing to suggest that he might go down the route of professional athletics. 
It would take an outsider to put him on the path to greatness. Charles Riley was the phys ed teacher at Fairmont Junior High School. One day, he saw the young, lanky teen running in the playground. The boy was such a natural that Riley told him he should train. When the boy said that he was too busy with work after school, Riley offered to let him train in the mornings. And so it was that Jesse Owens finally began to take running seriously. At this stage, Owens wasn't yet the miraculously fast runner that he had become. In fact, he wasn't even the fastest Riley had coached. Plenty of other boys in Cleveland had a natural talent for speed. Speed. Where Owens differed was his ability to take instruction. Riley didn't need to fight against natural arrogance or laziness. Whatever he said, Owens nodded, took it on board, and used it to improve his method. By the time the teenager moved up to East Cleveland Technical High, he was progressing so fast that Riley followed him as a volunteer coach. But Riley wasn't the only important person that Owens met. In 1928. That same year, Owens set eyes on Minnie Ruth Solomon for the first time, the woman he'd one day marry. But first, the couple had to survive the misery of the early 1930s. As the Great Depression bit, Henry Owens was thrown out of work, leaving Jesse scrabbling to support his family. At the same time, his running didn't seem to be going anywhere. He entered the Midwest in preliminary trials in 1932, but lost all of his races. But this would soon turn out to be just a minor hiccup. In spring 1933, Owens at last began to hit his stride, pulling out the jaw-dropping wins that would be a hallmark of his career. At the Ohio Interscholastic Finals, he won 75 of the 79 events he entered. Not long after, at the national championship in Chicago, he tied the world record for the 100-yard dash while still a high schooler. It was such a feat that the world began to take notice of this lanky, slightly dorky-looking boy from the South. Owens was inundated with university offers. But he felt he couldn't accept a place just anywhere. He needed to be both close to his family and able to work and earn some money for his parents. The only place that fit the bill was Ohio State. Although the college didn't offer him a scholarship, they did allow him to train with Larry Snyder, one of the few elite coaches to work with black kids. Classes also had a schedule that allowed Owens to work as a night elevator operator at the Ohio House of Representatives, earning $100 a month. Still, the setup wasn't perfect. Ohio State was racially divided. Owens was expected to sleep off campus, and when the athletics team went out to competitions, he had to stay in separate hotels and eat in separate restaurants. But if this bothered Owens, it didn't let it affect his running. By rights, the 1935 Big Ten Athletics meet in Michigan should have been a bust. Owens had injured his back, and Snyder begged him to take the day off. But Owens said that he wanted to try the 100 yards and see how things went. Turns out, they were going to go unbelievably well. In a single 45-minute period, Owens went from barely being able to walk due to his injury to breaking three world records and tying a fourth. As Owens dominated the 100 yards, the 220 yards, the 220 yards hurdles, and set a long jump record that wouldn't be broken for 25 years, it was clear to everyone that this kid was certainly something special. But it would only be two years later, in a city some 4,000 miles away, that they realized just how unique Jesse Owens really was. At the same time that Jesse Owens was transitioning from talented teenager to world record breaker, the nation of Germany was undergoing its own transformation. Back in 1931, when Owens was still in high school, the International Olympic Committee had awarded the 1936 Games to Weimar Germany. Unfortunately, two years later, Weimar Germany had been replaced with Nazi dictatorship, and now everyone was feeling super awkward about the whole Berlin Olympics thing. In April 1933, the Nazi sport office officially banned non-Aryans from athletics. Things looked so bad that the U.S. Amateur Athletic Union, or AAU, considered pulling out. That they didn't is thanks to one man. Avery Brundage was head of the U.S. Olympic Committee, and a guy absolutely determined to let his team compete, fascism be damned. In 1934, he went to Germany and reported back that Jewish athletes were being treated fairly, not realizing things had been staged for his benefit. Thanks to Brundage's report, the AAU voted narrowly to attend the Games. For Jesse Owens, it was the best present that he could get. Owens had been vocal about wanting the Olympics to go ahead, correctly sensing that this was his chance to make history. Although NAACP had issued a stern rebuke to black athletes who considered participating, Owens shrugged it off. He already lived in a society that discriminated against people like him who cared if Germany was yet another country that didn't like black folk. Adolf Hitler's Olympics opens on August the 1st with a spectacular ceremony memorably captured on film by real-life Stormfront equivalent Lenny Reifenstahl. But while the games were designed as a showcase for the Reich, Hitler was sure to show only the good parts. For the whole fortnight, racial laws were quietly relaxed. When Jesse Owens arrived with the American team, he was amazed to discover he could ride at the front of buses and eat at any restaurant he chose. Great as this was, though, Owens was here for only one thing, was to win. 
and win he did. The games started on August the 2nd. The very next day, Owens won his first gold, hitting the tape at the end of the 100 meters just a tenth of a second ahead of his teammate. It was the first of four golds for the athlete, and one that gave rise to a persistent myth that Hitler snubbed Owens after his win. Yes, that is absolutely a myth. As much as it makes sense that Hitler wouldn't want to congratulate a non-Aryan athlete, Owens's race wasn't why the dictator didn't shake his hand, at least not directly. The day before, when Owens hadn't been competing, Hitler had caused outrage by only congratulating German and Finnish gold medalists. The IOC told him that he had to either congratulate everyone or no one. Being a petulant d Hitler chose the latter. Not realizing this, the American media saw him refuse to meet Owens and reported it as a snub. But even this might not be the whole story. One sports writer present claimed he saw Owens led below the honor box, where he smiled and bowed, and Herr Hitler gave him a friendly little Nazi salute. The theory is that Hitler was swept by in the audience's adoration. German spectators were literally shouting, Oi Wenz, Oi Wenz, and Hitler felt compelled to acknowledge him. Still, while the story of the snub isn't true, that doesn't mean Owens hadn't just humiliated the Third Reich. Here was a black man, not just beating Hitler's Aryan Superman, but beating them with such ease that it was like watching the Flash run rings around Elmer Fudd. And Owens was only just getting started. For those two weeks in Berlin, Jesse Owens existed on a plateau above mere mortals. He picked up another gold in the 200 meters and yet another during the long jump. That last one, incidentally, was where he befriended German athlete Karl Ludwig Long, who gave him some brotherly advice between jumps that led to Owens beating Long at his own game. Between events, Owens was mobbed by fans, all of whom wanted to feel some of his magic rub off on them. That August, Owens was bigger than even LeBron James is today. In Ohio, a statewide Jesse Owens Day was decreed. It was a beautiful moment, and it's the one that we all still remember. The moments when the sports-watching world came together to celebrate the prowess of one impoverished black athlete from the South. Well, hold on to that good feeling while you can, because the real story is soon going to take a darker turn. The final event Owens took part in was the 400-meter relay. It wasn't an event he'd been scheduled to run in, but Avery Brundage, remember him, the U.S. Olympic Committee head who reported Jewish athletes were being treated well in Germany, decided not to offend Hitler by letting a Jewish runner compete and drafted in Owens as a replacement. It was a sordid decision, but it did allow Owens to net one final gold medal, bringing his total haul to four in four separate events, a feat no one would equal for 48 more years. As Owen collected his record-setting fourth gold, he remarked at the podium, There's a grand feeling standing up there. I never felt like that before. Sadly, this marked the final glorious high of Owens's athletic career. The dream started to tarnish the very next day. With Owens a global phenomenon, Avery Brundage realized the AAU could make a killing off him. So he signed the team up to compete in events across Europe without paying them a single penny. Before the games had even ended, Owens was dispatched to Cologne to compete in a race. The very next day, Brundage sent him alone to Prague without a dime to his name. By the time he arrived, Owens was so hungry, he had to ask a fellow passenger to buy him food. From there, it was another race in Germany, and then a flight to England that arrived so late Owens and the team were forced to sleep in an empty aircraft hangar. It was an exhausting schedule. By the time of his London races, Owens was clearly flagging, not even hitting times he'd made as a teenager under Charles Riley. He'd lost 11 pounds since arriving in Europe, and there was more to come. Without consulting him, Brundage signed Owens up to a packed schedule of races across Scandinavia. None of these would generate any money for Owens. All the while, telegrams were arriving from the US, offering him thousands of dollars to appear on popular radio shows. Perhaps it's no wonder Jesse Owens decided that he'd had enough. On August 15, 1936, Owens ran a third leg in a relay race in London. It was a nothing burger of a race, a minor event that seemed completely unremarkable at the time. Little could anyone watching have known but this would be Jesse Owens's last ever race. That same day, Owens told Brundage that he was through, that he was exhausted, sick of running, and was catching the next boat back to America. So Avery Brundage did what any sane, reasonable human being would do. He destroyed Jesse Owens's life. Like an overgrown man-baby throwing the most pathetic tantrum in recorded history, Brundage demanded the AAU permanently suspend Owens from racing. It was a suspension Brundage would zealously enforce for the next 40 years, ensuring the world's greatest sprinter could never compete again. For Jesse Owens, it was the end of the Berlin dream, and it was the beginning of a long nightmare.
We're now at the point where the story of Jesse Owens usually ends, with him enjoying a ticker tape parade in New York, an American hero. It's the warm, cozy version of Jesse Owens' life, the one that makes us feel good about ourselves. It's also sanitized to the point of irresponsibility. The narrative that Owens went to Berlin and humiliated Hitler for Team USA may be true, but it completely leaves out how America, in turn, humiliated Owens. This was an era when even sporting heroes couldn't escape racial discrimination, when the president could invite every white athlete from the Olympic team to the White House, but snub the greatest athlete of them all because of his skin color. As Owens himself told a crowd, Hitler didn't snub me. It was Roosevelt who snubbed me. The president didn't even send me a telegram. But maybe it's no wonder we gloss over this part. No one likes a sad story. No one likes to hear how Owens was forced to ride the freight elevator up to his own celebration party because the main elevator was reserved for whites. So, if you like your history soft and sanitized, just switch off now. Because the real story of Jesse Owens doesn't end with his victory, but with America slowly grinding down its own hero. The most immediate and pressing problem was Brundage's vindictive racing ban. Despite all the offers of well-paying jobs back home, Owens had found most of them amounted to nothing. But he could no longer make money by competing in the USA either. In desperation, Owens tried looking further afield, landing a contract to run against the Cuban sprinter Conrado Rodriguez in Havana just after Christmas. But then Brundage let Rodriguez know that he could run against Owens in Havana, sure, but if he did so, he would never be able to run in the USA again. When Rodriguez inevitably pulled out, the organizer were forced to come up with a desperate last-minute replacement. And that's how, on a wet Christmas in 1936, just four months after winning a record haul of gold medals, Jesse Owens found himself running not a serious race in Cuba against a serious opponent, but against a racehorse. Yes. In front of 3,000 people during halftime at a soccer match, Owens took on the horse at a 100-yard dash, reducing his incredible talent to a mere sideshow attraction. At the time, he spoke about how grateful he was for the opportunity to run again, but much later, he would confess that it was demeaning. Those races made me sick, he said. I felt like a freak. Sadly, this would now be his life. After racing the horse in Cuba, Owens realized that these sorts of humiliating spectacles were the only way he could legally run. So he began racing dogs, motorbikes, trains, and even Joe Lewis, the world heavyweight champion. Knowing how one-sided that race would be, Owens gamely pretended to trip, giving the boxer a fighting chance. When Owens tried to work a regular job, it invariably failed. In 1938, he co-founded a dry-cleaning company, boasting that his status as the world's fastest man would mean clients would get their shirts back in double-quick time. But the business went under in barely a year. In May 1939, Jesse Owens filed for bankruptcy. Just think for a second about how strange that is. Like if Usain Bolt had gone from the 2008 Olympics to waiting tables at Denny's or something like that. Yet this was the world of the 1930s. A world in which a black man of unbelievable talent could be screwed over by one petty white jerk holding a grudge. Thankfully, Owens would live long enough to see that change. In the end, it took Gerald Ford for a president to officially acknowledge Jesse Owens. That's 40 years. 40 years after white athletes you've never heard of got to party with FDR while black Olympians were frozen out. During those four decades, Owens lived a roller coaster life, oscillating wildly between periods of unemployment and relative wealth. Among his lowest moments, stunt races aside, were getting fired from a sales position within six weeks, working briefly as a nightclub entertainer, and being prosecuted for tax evasion. On the other end of the scale, though, Owens could often use his celebrity to land well paying jobs like his stinted PR or as a motivational speaker. While these jobs invariably fell through, they were enough to keep his family in a comfortable, middle class existence. As someone who'd known grinding poverty in his childhood, Owens wasn't shy about wanting to make money. He famously once said of the raised fist black power salute that the only time the black fist has any significance is when there's money inside. It was a quote that generated a ton of controversy, but perhaps it also shows us some essential truth about Jesse Owens. He'd come from nothing to make a success of himself, only to watch as his running career was snatched away. Maybe it's no wonder he concluded that wealth was the only way to make America respect a black man. Yet even in these wilderness years, Owens never lost his spark of greatness. In 1950, aged 36, he ran a 100-yard charity dash in Milwaukee. His time was 9.7 seconds, almost as fast as his legendary performance back in 1935. Even now, he still had it. The low period of Jesse Owens's life finally came to an end in 1955. That year, President Eisenhower named Owens an ambassador of sports. The idea was that he'd travel the world operating running clinics as a way to promote American soft power during the Cold War. But for Owens, it really meant two things. A chance to travel 
and a chance to finally earn a stable income. As the decades passed and the Berlin Olympics got further away, the American establishment slowly began to embrace the athlete that it had once shunned. Owens was appointed to several sports associations, even working for the U.S. Olympic Committee. Famously, this led to him attempting to mediate between the USOC and Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the two athletes who raised the Black Power salute at the 1968 Olympics. A natural conservative, Owens' intervention was seen as out of touch by the civil rights generation, who dismissed him as an Uncle Tom. Yet Owens wasn't aware of the racial tensions rolling America at the time. Four years later, he had declared he changed his mind on black militancy. Finally, in 1976, Owens got the White House recognition had so long been denied. That year, Gerald Ford awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Just three years later, Jimmy Carter would further bestow the Living Legends Award on him. At last, Owens was taking his rightful place as America's sporting hero. It happens just in time. Jesse Owens died on March 31, 1980, at the age of 66. A lifelong smoker, it was lung cancer that finally got him. With his passing, Owens left behind a strange, shining legacy, one that's perhaps unique. To this day, his performance at the 1936 Olympics is legendary. He remains a household name, right up there with Jackie Robinson or Muhammad Ali. Yet while Robinson and Ali and others like them are known for long, spectacular careers, Owens' fame rests on a single 15-month stretch. One year, plus some change, from the Big Ten meet in 1935, where he broke three world records to the Olympics in 1936. And yet, this was enough to ensure that we'd still be talking about him 85 years later. The story of Jesse Owens is many things. A tale of triumph over adversity, of discrimination in 20th century America, and of the moment Adolf Hitler saw his dumb racial theories faceplant in the mud. But it's also a what if. What if Owens had been able to keep competing, to keep reaching for glory after the Olympics? Well, we'll sadly never know, but it almost doesn't matter. In his too short career, Jesse Owens managed to give us an icon, a sporting hero whose life still remains relevant to this very day. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.